Let's start with something very simple, something very simple that everybody would understand if you look at the PowerPoint. Causality, that's the, the core of the universal truth. You sow what you reap. So words, we can't think without words. Words leads to inner thoughts. Without words, you cannot think. So there must be a language in your mind, some words in your mind. This is fire, this is the sun, this is moon. You know, you have you need words. When you have words in your mind, then you create thoughts. When you have thoughts, then gradually you carry your thoughts into action or speech. And when the actions and speech are repeatedly done, it becomes your habits. And when you have habits, uh, frequently perform, it becomes your personality, and personality becomes your destiny. And your destiny is actually your zamzara, your life and death. Now then, this looks like a very simple analysis, um, but we start with words and then we have thoughts. But actually words also start from thoughts. Who created the words? Thoughts. In this version of life, we're looking only at one life. But before that, you also have previous lives. We call it reincarnations. When you have previous lives in your, in your hidden consciousness, you have already the habitual energies in there, which contain all this latent energy. When we reincarnate into another form, another body, actually we carry with ourselves the latent energy. So, for a baby, of course, a baby hasn't been taught some words like fire, food, crying, smiling, mom, dad. A baby still have to be educated as to words, but he or, he or she, the baby, already have the latent energy in there. So it's easy to collect these words together as the baby grows. So these, you sow what you reap, causality, effects, causes and effects. When you look at this slide, it seems to be so simple. So simple, right? It's so simple, but it's very complicated. It, it, it tells your whole life. Now, if we want to find out what's the most important, um, if we can say, philosophy in there. What did we learn? What did we learn just from this slide? Just from this PowerPoint slide? What did we learn? Different people look at it and say, okay, this is a few words. You saw what you reap. You saw what you reap. This is what it is. But what is the basic, the, under, the underlying, most important philosophy in there, the thinking in there? If we can say, choose one word that is the most important in there. Choose one word that's the most important. Thoughts, right. Thoughts. Buddhism is the studying of the mind, thought. How important is a thought? How important? The thought is your thinking, your consciousness, what you think. If you have a failure thought, it's going to be leading into a failure action or a failure speech. So the thought creates you whether it's a happy you, a sad you, a sorrowful you, a respectful you, it depends on your thought. So are you not going to study how you think? That's what Buddhism is all about. This school of Buddhism is about thinking. Now how important is it if I know how to think? It's very important that you have the right thinking. Um, hmm? Yeah, your point of view. But your point of view could be bigotry, could be egoistic. Everybody has a point of view. Everybody has, has that internal commentator in there. Whenever they look at anything, they look at it with tainted glasses. That hidden thought, the habitual thought is already in there. So 
We're not going to judge which point of view is good, which point of view is right. We're going to go into how we think first, not to put our judgment into what's your point of view, how, how come you think that way. But let's study objectively as to how we think. That's what the Buddha told us, how to study objectively as to how you think, how you carry out your life, why, why are you what you are today? Who are you? Where do you come from? Isn't that the most important? Who are you? Who am I? Why am I thinking what I'm thinking? Why am I at my position right now? So the next question is, who am I? Who am I? Very simple question. Who am I objectively? I wouldn't say I'm John, I'm Jeanette. I'm the son of my father. I won't think that way. Who am I objectively? Who am I? I am body and mind. Very simple. If you say, I am John, you stigmatize that you are a John. A John is brought up in that category. It's brought up with that background. We're not, we're not object, objective anymore. So we're not, we want to study it objectively. We are, everybody is, body and mind. How do we think? So what is this body and mind? I'm just doing a review of what I've been talking about in, I've been talking for at least 60 hours. And how can I do a review in 15 minutes? But I'll try my best because I need to warm up. I need to recollect on what I've been talking about. And I, I have been away for, for two months now. And there's some newcomers in here. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. But this, this is something very profound. This is about a school of thought of consciousness in the Sanskrit languages, which Nana Matra taught. It's, it's a deep psychology of the mind, expounded by the Buddha. So what is this? So we say we are body and mind. And what is this body? Body, we have internal organs, hair, everything. That's material, that's molecules. And then we have tongue, nose, ears, eyes. Why do we particularly point out the tongues, the, the nose, the ears, and, and the eyes? That's the body anyway. Why do we pinpoint that and pull that out and discuss that in detail? Because those are the senses with which we interact with the world. We have a body. We have a heart, a spleen, lung, intestines, and all that. But the Buddha wants to point out how do you contact the world. So the Buddha wants to, to bring out eyes, ears, nose, tongue. Those are the sensory organs together with the body. That's the body part. And how about the mind? The mind has perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. And do you remember the five scantus that we always have been talking about? What is this? Body, perception, conception, volition, cons consciousness. These are the five items, and the Buddha called them the five scanters, the five aggregates. That, uh, that word always appears in sutras. Okay. And all this is materiality, material. And this part is the spirit, spirituality, the spiritual part. Perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. Perception is about the eyes, the ears, the nose, and the tongue, what they perceive. Conception is conceptualization of the inner mano consciousness. Volition is carrying it into actions already from the seeds, from the latent energy into express action and speech. And consciousness is the storage of all these things. Those are the five scanters. Next. I think therefore I am. The five scanters, body and mind, material, perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. And then we particularly bring out the senses, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. We also have the eyes interact with objects, ears interact with sound, nose with smell, tongue with taste, body with touch, and mind with... How does the mind interact with? With everything. Everything you can name, everything you can dream of. As a matter of fact, Everything that you haven't dreamt of, inconceivable, we call that. Things that I never imagined that kind of thing exist. 
out of our imagination, out of our you know, conceivable mentality. So these envi- the vi- environments, and because the senses contact, interact with environments, would give rise to consciousness. Eyes consciousness, vision, vision consciousness, audit, auditory consciousness, olfaction consciousness, taste, tactility, mentality, ego. We have an ego consciousness in there. And the alaya consciousness, which is storage and interaction house for all. And this alaya consciousness is responsible for the, that's the essence, that's the core or the inconceivable essence that is reincarnating all the time, invisible. When we die, nothing exists except the alaya consciousness. The alaya consciousness roll into the next body, into the next round of reincarnation. All right, next. And then we say, okay, we have all these. Remember, we are objectively talking about thinking, not about point of view. Point of view is, is egoistic. Your point of view, my point of view, they are different. Why do we have mental afflictions? Because our consciousness attached to external objects. Attachment is habitual thinking that occupies the mind. During the attachment, concurrent mental functions arise simultaneously to disrupt our inter- inner peace. In other words, when we have consciousness arising because of our senses interacting with environments, concurrently, there are mental functions working with your consciousness to interact. Due to habitual attachment, our mind becomes set on predetermined thoughts. These thoughts can create uncontrollable reactions such as anger, jealousy, hatred, sadness, inferior complex, sensual indulgences that, that perpetuate our problems and sufferings in life. That's the reason why we have sufferings. We have mental afflictions. We have sadness. We have jealousy. We have hatred. We have anger. We have greediness. And attachment to desires arising from greed, hatred, and ignorance and lead us to samsara, life and death reincarnation. You are what you have molded you to be in previous life and in the past. Not by God. Not because of your mom and dad. Not because of your background education. Sure, your background education would, would, if, would have effect and what you're thinking. But it's because of the attachment to desires arising from greed, hatred, and ignorance, just to summarize them. Desires have so, there's so many facets of desires. The, the, the Buddha only point out the, the, you know, the most important, the, the major three. And we'll study all these desires, the categories of these desires as we, as we go along. So why do we reincarnate? It's because of our attachment to desires. Habitually. You may not even notice that you're attaching to desires. You think that, you, you take that for granted. You take it for granted that you can kill animals for food. You take it for granted that you can have any relations you want as, you, as long as the two parties agree to each other, as long as you like it. You take it for granted that you, you look after your self-interest first and not the others. We have many things that we take for granted. We take it for granted we can discriminate on inferior people. We take it for granted that we can, as long as we're happy, you can do anything. That's a taken for granted kind of attitude. Next. So, how does our thinking consciousness work in giving a review? This is just a a review. So when our sensory organs are in contact with objects, what is arising? When the the sensory organs themselves are not consciousness, they're just tools of consciousness. External objects are certainly not consciousness. They are apart from consciousness. So where is consciousness then? What is consciousness? So when sensory organs are interacting with objects arising, consciousness arise, right? Okay, consciousness arise, and 
when consciousness arise, they attach to external objects. When a greedy person, Christmas time, he wanted to buy a diamond ring for his wife. And he went into a shop, he shop around, he was quite greedy, um, he has a stealing attitude, and he tried in every way to steal that diamond ring. He attached to it. So he, he attached to the external objects, he attached to the fact that he wanted to make his wife happy, and he doesn't really care whether he's, do, he's do, doing, doing a, a misbehavior of stealing. So consciousness attached to objects. And consciousness depends on sensory organs, of course. So, when the eyes, ears, no tongue, body, and mind interact with matter, sound, smell, taste, touch, and all dharmas, consciousness arises. Next. How do we study consciousness? By these different facets. We have, first, we have to, the Buddha said first, you have to study the external objects first. How do we perceive the world? What is this world make up of? The three realms. The world with desire, the world without desire, the world without material, the three realms. I already have mentioned that in detail. I'm just doing a review. Uh, for those who don't know um, objects of the world, you really have a lot to catch up with. I've been talking for 60 hours already on this subject, and I haven't really, st I, I only have covered about half, but I need to go on. Uh, most of knowledge, how do we get to know the world? How do we get to know the world? Uh, direct perception, direct knowledge, or postulation, or analysis, investigation, reasoning. How do we get to know it? Conceptualization. How do we conceptualize things? So modes of knowledge. We, are, we already have talked about all these. Moral nature. When we perceive the world, how do we perceive the world from the perspective of morality? How come sometimes we judge, this is moral, this is immoral, this is wrong, this is right, this is, this is right, this is wrong, this is neutral. How do we do it? From a morality point of view. Realms of acti activities, are where, how does our consciousness work in different realms, in different situations? Fifth, concomitant mental functions. And when our consciousness arises, what kind of mental functions concurrently work with our consciousness to carry out actions and speech? We already have talked about all these. Necessary precondi preconditions for all this to happen. Next, how does each consciousness function? Eighth, how do we transform this tainted consciousness into enlightenment? Not just talking about consciousness. How do we change this consciousness, tainted, polluted consciousness, into purity, into enlightenment, into nirvana? That's what the Buddha has been teaching us. Nine, results of practice. What is Buddhahood? What is nirvana? Why do we have to study all these? From cause to effect, when we become Buddha, how does it happen? What's the purpose of transforming our tainted consciousness into pure spirituality. So as you see, that's how we study. There's nothing about believing just in the Buddha, Buddha and you don't worry about anything and Buddha will forgive you, Buddha will save you from hell, Buddha will do this, will do that for you. Buddha said, you have to save yourself. You can't just depend on an external source to save you. You do your salvation. Salvation has a connotation of self not just other to save you. Your destiny is in your hands. Your thinking, your thought. Don't blame anybody for the mistakes, for the sufferings that you have been going through. You are the master of your own fate. But you need to know how to master it, how to change it. 
That's what the Buddha is talking about in consciousness. Next, then we also talk about, when we talk about the world, how do we perceive the world, we also talk about all things in the universe can be classified into conditioned things and unconditioned things, or conditioned dharmas. The word dharmas means all things. We don't know how to, what's the right word for all things, we just call it dharmas. If the Dharma has a capital D, it means the Buddha's method to understand the Dharma. The condition is that which has been created by causality. The four Dharmas arising, always, duration and impermanence, and the characteristics of conditioned things. They are all subject to causality, changeability, impermanence, and samsara. So there are, roughly speaking, 94 conditioned Dharmas. Actually, you cannot classify Dharma. All things in the universe, there are so billions of them, how can you classify them? But for the sake of discussion, for the sake of, of understanding, the Buddha classified it into 94 dharmas, so that we can study what we perceive in detail. Unconditioned dharma, the unconditioned has neither cause or re nor result, they are not subject to causality, changeability, impermanence and samsara. They are conditions the unconditioned lasts eternally uh, in its own nature. So the unconditioned becomes something that is about eternity, something about getting out from life and death. There are six unconditioned dharmas. And then we say, okay, 94 plus 6 is 100. Why don't we look at conditioned dharmas in detail? Conditioned dharmas can consist of consciousnesses, eight consciousnesses, 51 concomitant mental functions, 11 forms, materiality, and 24 dharmas, neither form nor mental functions, 24 of them. So all these add together will have 100. So why 100? More than 100, it should be infinity but we can't just study infinity right we have to bring it out to study it we have to bring it out and study it's just like when we study neutrons electrons protons and all that we give it names but how minute things can be it can go forever and ever it can be subdivided even the my, the most minute thing can be subdivided and how can you in with infinity start to subdivide it. It takes millions of years. So you, get, you have to talk about what you, can, what you can prove, what you can talk. So we say atom, neutron, protons, we give it names. But, the, but even neutron can be subdivided. Electron can be subdivided. We have to give it names infinitely. We can't do it like that. So the Buddha classified it into 94 and unconditioned dharmas into six. Actually, unconditioned dharma cannot be talked about because it's beyond language. But for the sake of talking about it, the Buddha gave, gives six unconditioned dharma to, to talk about the universe. I, last time I stopped at 51 concomitant mental functions. And in the 51, what's the detail of this 51? So concomitant mental functions is when your I consciousness or A consciousness arise, what other mental functions arise simultaneously to help your consciousness to perform, to think, to talk? So we have five generally interactive functions, which is attention, contact, sensation, perception, and volition, the five. We also have the particular functions, desire, resolve, mindfulness, concentration, and intelligence. And then we also talk about unwholesome functions. We have six unwholesome uh, or mental afflictions, the root, the basic ones, eight primary mental functions, two medium, and 10 minor. We have 26 of them. I remember we have already have covered the unwholesome 26 functions. Then we haven't started the wholesome functions, 
and the four indeterminate functions. To add it together, 51. It's very important that we know these concomitant mental functions because these are the ministers who help the king to perform. We have eight kings in our mind. We call it the eight consciousnesses. And then we have all these ministers, officials, who help these eight kings in your mind to perform. Now, if we understand them thoroughly, what happened? You have a very strong parliament. You know everything about a parliament. You can rule your country in the best way. What is your country? Your mind is your country. You don't know your parliament. You don't know your mind. Now you know everything about your mind. Then you can gear your mind towards the right thinking. You can gear your, your mind towards success. Success in life, happiness in life. Do you want to gear your mind in the right way? Do you want to know your parliament before you make the policies? That's what the Buddha is teaching us to do. The parliament of your own mind. Understand every minister is in there. Understand all the chairmen, all the secretaries. Perform it well. Lead a happy life in this life. And more than that, after this life finishes, go on to a world that is beyond suffering. So the, the Buddhist teaching has twofold functions. Actually, threefold. Past, present, and future. The past is already gone. The Buddha told you what the past has created for you. You can't change the past. Can anybody change the past? Nobody can change the past. But people start to attach to the past. Attach to sufferings of the past. Attach to happiness of the past. The past can never come back. The Buddha point out to you the past so that you, you learn lessons from them. You don't attach to them. The past, the present, lead a happy life by understanding the parliament of your own mind. Everything in that parliament. How to set your policies in life. And then future, what happened in the future? When this life is performed and you died, we all died, you go into that nirvana where there's, where there's no more reincarnations, no more suffering. In there, there's, there's one purity. And some of the religions, we call it heaven. Oasis. That's nirvana, away from all suffering. So next time, we're going to have, we're going to talk about concom concomitant mental functions, the wholesome functions, and the four indeterminate functions.